We're going to talk for the next, for the next hour or so about, about um, the path to seamless travel. So we're a travel and technology media title. So we are obsessed with what technology can do for travel, constantly write about it and talk about it. And that's what we're going to do for the next hour or so. Um, Welcome everybody to this session. I'm going to kick things off. We've got a panel of three experts. I'll introduce them and then introduce our first sort of speaker with first questions. On the far side, we've got uh, Alex Vieira, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Mabrian Technologies. Welcome, Alex. He's all the way from Spain. Next to Alex, we have Francois Blanc. So we're going French this time. Uh, he's from Amadeus. He's the Traveler ID Managing Director at Amadeus. Welcome. And then we've got a Scottish voice <laughs> to go along with my British voice, um, or English. And we've got Mike Ferguson, who's commercial director from Skyscanner. I'm sure you all know those brands. So we're going we're to start with Mike, um, because Skyscanner has done some re recent research with customers. And I think it's actually out today. Is it Mike? Or That's right. It should, so be, out, should be out at some point later. So this is hot off the press, a little bit of a sneak preview. Um, Mike's going to run, well, uh, Mike in a minute will run through some of the key findings. It, it's quite generic. I mean, we're looking at what travelers are saying they like from their travel and want from their travel. It's a bit of an update on where we are post COVID, so that's kind of interesting. And that will take us into this idea of what customer expectations and demands are now post, post COVID. So, Mike, over you, what, what, just go run through the, what, you've, what you've seen to be the key findings from your, cust from your, you know, your clients, your customers. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Lee. So, um, as Lee mentioned, there's a, a, our Horizons report, which we've been issuing quarterly for the past two years. Uh, the latest one is out, uh, out today. Um, it focuses on Q1 2022, so I'm going to run through a few of the key findings, um, and uh, there'll be a lot more detail in the report, which you'll be able to download if you, if you are interested. You'll be able to download that from the Skyscanner Partners website later today at some point. Um, so the report is based on Skyscanner's own data, so that's our, our own uh, search, uh, redirect, and booking data. It also comprises some, uh, some um, uh, polling data that we use as well. It covers things like uh, travel spend, booking horizon trends, haul types, trip lengths, and, uh, and trending destinations, which I personally find particularly interesting. So our research shows that, that, um, that globally travel is, um, travel is back, and um, uh, our travelers are prioritizing an increase in spend this year. Um, price sensitivity does still exist, which isn't a massive surprise. Um, but we see, we see signs that, that there's a lot of normalization coming through now. Um, trip duration is up, especially when you look at the, at the, the, key, uh, the key seasons, the summer and the, and the winter holidays. Um, and long haul travel is making a, a long awaited uh, recovery, which um, is great for probably everyone in this room and particularly good for, for airlines. Some specific trends are for, for, for this region. Um, travelers are up in their budgets, as I mentioned. 86% uh, of travelers are going to spend at least what they spent in 2019 on international travel this year. And of that 86%, one in two travelers plan to spend more than what they did in 2019. Um, that, that additional spend is going on two things, really. It's going on longer durations, and it's also going on accommodation upgrades. So that additional spend is being distributed quite nicely across, across the, the, the travel space. Um, Shorter booking horizons do remain prevalent. Uh, they are, the, the booking horizons are shorter than they were pre-pandemic, but they are, they are, they are uh, starting to stabilize. So we're seeing a growth in the 30 to 59 day segment and growth in the 60 to 89 day segments as well. So that's a really strong indicator that confidence um, in travel is coming back and that the, the, the travelers are less, um, less fearful of, um, of, of, of sort of knee-jerk reactions and lockdowns and so on. So that's, again, a great thing to see. Um, some other key points probably to share. City breaks, they're also coming back. Um, they, they were depressed quite a lot. And the, 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 the real highlight in terms of um, what we're seeing is um, ultimate luxurious breaks are a key component, as are bucket list uh, holidays. That's another big, big trend that we're seeing, uh, seeing this year. A um, couple of other things to mention, I suppose. We have uh, Doha is, the, is the, 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 the biggest trending destination this year. And that's driven by the, uh, the World Cup. That's up 172 places. So that's the, the Qatar World Cup in, uh, in November and December. Izmir in Turkey is, um, is ridden by 150 places. And again, that's down to uh, additional um, airline routes being launched. And uh, another one is Amman in Jordan. Um, there are more and more um, routes being launched out of European cities there. So that's some key findings from, uh, from our report, Lee. Um, I think, yeah, ultimately, travel definitely is coming back and, uh, and spend is increasing, which is, which is great. 
Yeah, and, and the way that sort of, I guess, fits with our theme of the next hour or so is, is what you're seeing is that commitment to travel from the traveling community, from travelers and holidaymakers, whatever you want to call them, is absolutely there. They're committed, they're, they're, they're committing not only time, but money to it. And, and that's reflected in, in what they expect from their travel, I think, isn't it? So it's not that expectations have gone down. If anything, they've gone up because what COVID has taught people is that I, I need to be looked after more, more, uh, uh, more closely by my trusted travel brand because I need that information to hand to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah very much so. Um, and the, the pent up demand that we all um, assumed was there and that we all hoped was there is, is definitely starting to realize. Um, but that, that increase in spend is indicative of exactly what you've just talked about there, Lee. Let's bring Alex in, because I know, you, Alex, you are a, a, you know, a data company. Uh, you have lots of data points in the business which you then provide back to the industry. What one of them is assessing customer sentiment, a bit like Skyscanner from a different perspective. But so what, let's talk to us about what you're seeing at, at Mabrian and how that fits in with what Mike has just told us about from the Skyscanner point yeah. of view. Uh, basically, uh, w w what we're seeing, it's, it's completely aligned to what Mike uh, has shared. We collect data from uh, s uh, social media and also from, from other components. In terms of expenditure, for instance, and, and, and the budget, we also see this trend, uh, which is uh, also related to the extension of, of uh, or the duration of, of, the tri of the trips. Uh, in terms of sentiment of, of visitors, what we're seeing are uh, some interesting insights are related to switching in the interests once on the destination. And we get this based on what we get from social media, but also based on what we get from the spending on destination of, of visitors. Over the last year, the last few months, we've seen that uh, expenditure in, in uh, outdoor activities is growing. The interest in outdoor activities is also growing. Uh, Visitors tend to spend less out of its budget in, in hotels and uh, spread more in, in other categories in terms of, of the expenditure. And also another component that is uh, quite relevant is, is related to the perception of security and how safe the destination is. And this is one of the key indicators that our clients that are typically t the DMOs take a look to the evolution, right? Th they have a spike in terms of... Uh, 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 COVID mentioned at the beginning of the crisis, then they've been monitoring uh, how, how this has uh, evolved and, and, and reflect. But now the confidence levels, uh, and this is also related to the, the anticipation of travel and the, the, the way that people is not waiting to last minute and they are starting to, to again, or they are going back to, to, to book in advance. Uh, but there are a few components that industry-wide probably are here to stay. For instance, uh, flexibility, in, in which is something that had uh, that, that companies had to bring into the table due to the circumstances, but we think that this is something that will stay for a while, right? That's as well as uh, also there's a, 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 an economic or, or a surplus or in, in savings and, and an extra appetite to, to consume travel. So this uh, benefits the, both the duration and the, and the expenditure on the destination. But also this demand or this request for, for flexibility, uh, it's, 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 it's there and we think that it will, it's, it's here to stay. I know bef before COVID, you had a, uh, a, a sentiment tracker based around people's perceptions of security of, yeah. a, of a destination. Yeah. So actually that obviously then came into COVID and people's perceptions of the safety, health and safety yeah. of a destination. Yeah. Are you, are you see, have you seen that countries with a perception have generated a perception that they dealt with the pandemic well are coming out of the pandemic better than maybe those that yeah generally sp of. generally speaking the the uh, the the scores that we get on on countries are getting better and are, and are getting better compared to to the past normal let's say 2019 um, some of these countries some of these destinations based on what what they were ca they were capturing in this data they focused on communicating around COVID measures and how to deal with that. And, uh, but this is something that it's quite a standard on, on destinations. And uh, another interesting thing that we can maybe talk later in terms of uh, what visitors uh, request from destinations is related to travel sustainability. I mean, w w last year it was about uh, resilience and recovery. 
this year we are starting again to hear about uh, sustainability and this is something that is cross industry. So visitors tend to look at uh, different indicators of sustainability when they are on the, their inspirational part of, of searching uh, for travel, but then they also, uh, when they share their, their experiences on the destination, they, they, they also talking about, about this. Yeah, we, we will touch on sustainability again maybe a bit later on. The, 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 it's the flexibility idea that's interesting. It takes us into th being flexible is about providing an experience that is seamless. Well, that's where it, that, that's a segue into this session. Yeah. And, and, and if anything's come out of COVID, the word flexible seems to be the one that, you know, is, is, is everywhere and the customers are expecting it. Fr Francois, uh, we'll come to you a bit, some of the specifics about what travel's doing in terms of technology, but just this idea of flexibility, I guess, is, wor is what the industry has taken from the pandemic. It, if, you, if you can't be flexible and adaptable uh, in real time and quickly for the customer, then you probably, you know, you're not providing the service they expect today. So that's, uh, that's super important. And as well, I think the something which is important for travelers when they come back on the road is to avoid bad surprise. If we want to make it seamless, we need to prevent bad surprise to travelers, especially the ones who stop traveling for a bit of time because they got out of the habit of uh, doing uh, things as uh, simple as preparing their paperwork for travel. So I'll give you one example. During COVID, um, during COVID you had to come to the airport with a COVID certificate. If you come with the wrong paper, you may be denied boarding. If you want to enter a country and you don't have your visa, you may be denied entry. So one of the things we've done working with partners was to build a piece of technology during COVID to make it seamless again, to make the providing all of this paperwork, all of these headaches that travelers have when they want to travel, very simple and seamless. So that's one of the things we did uh, during the pandemic. And now uh, it was about resilience, what you said. And uh, the way we're expanding that now going forward is to expand this piece of technology that airline has been using, more than 20 airlines, to as well look at not just COVID documentation, but uh, visa for people who travel abroad, passports, and then make it seamless at the airport as well. Some of the airports have biometric gates. If we check your paperwork ahead of the trip, you can go through without showing your papers. And if you arrive in Dubai and want to rent a car, I mean, in this century, why coming to the check-in and show your driving license and get a plastic key? If you do all of this paperwork check ahead of the trip, you can just go get the car and drive. So in terms of uh, the road to seamless experience, uh, flexibility is important when there's disruption, but as well, taking care of all of this uh, paperwork to avoid bad surprise at the last minute, and as well, uh, when we provision this system, digital keys, biometric gates, avoiding queuing is important. Uh, we saw during COVID massive queues in the airport. We want to get rid of that. I mean, all this was happening before COVID, and everyone knew it needed to happen. Progress was patchy, slow, maybe even backwards sometimes. If you know a major incident happened, you, you added more layers of security that caused more problems. Has, has, has COVID changed that dynamic now? I mean, is that now just going to happen, come what may, and, and the barriers that used to be there have gone? I do believe so. It's, uh, this crisis has been a fantastic accelerator for a lot of technologies. Uh, if you see the speed at which, for example, a regional government, the European Union, has built technologies for this COVID pass, 30 countries out of Europe wanted to be part of the platform. So I believe that uh, when travels come back in force, we see these numbers that you are providing. People want to travel again. They want to spend more. And what we need to do uh, with a bunch of partners is to make this experience work at scale again. And COVID has accelerated the introduction of uh, touchless technologies and digital technologies. If you look at uh, travel companies, a lot of put staff on furlough. They struggle to get people back uh, in the workforce. So they need digitalization to make these processes that used to be manual seamless and to avoid all these queues for travelers, which is what we want. And I, don't know, I know you're doing, I think you've mentioned Dubai Airport, where again, you don't have to show paperwork anymore. I think you're doing something in Jordan as well, aren't you? You've, you've just started, is that biometric boarding and check-in? So what we did uh, in Jordan a few months ago was uh, another pilot, another demonstration of the biometric technology for backdrop and for boarding. When you go to an airport, if you want to drop your bag, if you go to the check-in corner, there's a queue. But if you go to one of these automatic backdrop, and if there's a biometric camera, you can safely deposit your bag 
and be sure in terms of security that it's not anyone who drop anything <laughs> on the plane, you see? And same story for boarding. And so what we did in Jordan uh, with the airline and the airport is to put some biometric gates in place. We did that in several airports, and we have that live in some, in some places uh, at scale to automate this process to make it touchless and to reduce the queues. Yeah. And uh, is it, I mean, is this technology now sort of faultless? I, I, I only ask because I, I, I did hear about a couple of incidents where using uh, iris scanners is, is difficult for, for various reasons, not for everybody, and in, in some instances doesn't work. And of course, if the technology is the only thing that's in place, what's the backup? Is, is there a danger that too much um, confidence is placed on the technology working, and then when there's a problem, it's hard to rectify that? So what, what I see is a, a risk-based approach, depending on the players in the industry. So government, for example, at immigration, they will have a specific kind of standard and threshold for biometrics to accept these technologies to work. And you have biometrics for border control in many places for a lot of time. I mean, in Gatwick, when I was living in London, in Ifro, security, boarding, have a different level of uh, uh, assurance, if you want, so different kind of standard. But the progress has been fantastic. I mean, you can check biometric people, even with a mask. Uh, so it's, 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 it's working. And depending on the use case, immigration, border control, boarding on the plane, dropping a bag, the level of uh, assurance that you need is different. So we provide a set, we and other players on the, on the marketplace, obviously, provide technologies for all of these use cases. So, so Mike, I mean, we just talked there about seamless travel. That's just within the airport. I mean, that's a, a very tiny part of any journey. You've, and, and actually, Francois will start to talk about the post-airport experience, getting a car, a car hire, and the sort of seamless experience you might have, which even today seems like a little like science fiction, because the idea of us walking out an airport, picking a key up without talking to anybody and driving off, it's not really there, but, it, but we, know it, we know it's coming. But then you've got the pre-booking pre experience, which is where you, sort of you guys come in when someone's shopping. What, what does seamlessness mean to Skyscanner for those customers who are at that start of their journey and just want all the information to do a proper search um, and comparison of the options? Yeah, so I mean, I think, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, booking, booking travel has always been complex and um, it starts online. The, 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 the pandemic introduced a whole host of new complexities. Um, in the depths of the pandemic, there was a, you know, the, 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 every country was introducing their own rules, their own restrictions, and they were changing so, so frequently that that really created a, a whole lot of apprehension and, uh, and degraded confidence in, in, in people booking. That's some of the trends I mentioned earlier on. That's why they're recovering, because of the, there's far more stability. Um, what we introduced during COVID, a really, really popular feature that we introduced was the COVID-19 map, which, um, which allowed travelers to, uh, to, to basically identify where they were firstly able to go to, because there was a lot of countries that weren't open, and then for those countries that were open, what was required in order to get into them. So the COVID-19 the COVID map that we introduced was, was a huge component in, in trying to make travel, um, maybe seamless would be a, a stretch during the pandemic, but making it more accessible and more, uh, and more feasible. Um, other things we did to support the, the traveler during that period of time was the introduction of, uh, of, of COVID-19 travel insurance, uh, which was a, a, a huge, huge success. Um, and we still constantly publish uh, data on, on, uh, on what's required for, 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 for different areas, different, different countries and accessing them. I mean, that, yeah, so that's the that's sort of things brought in during COVID, but even going back to your, even going back to your core task of uh, transparency on pricing, it, it, Sounds like it should be simple, but we, you, we both know it's not. Not least because, you know, there are some players out there who don't want there to be that much transparency. You know, th th there's, th there's a game to play. They want to be top of the search or not, even not on the search at all. So in, in some instances, um, the consumer is, you know, it, well, the business uh, aspect of this is not, is not aligned with the consumer expectation. Did you, is that ever going to change? Are we always going to have this? Uh, situation where there's going to be a little disconnect there. I think there's, the, you know, with, with, I can talk from a Skyscanner perspective, and we, we've always positioned ourselves as being an unbiased platform, and any search results you do see on Skyscanner are are entirely organic. So there's no influencing of the of the results based on on, on partners or, or relationships. Um, we have around uh, 1,200 partners, so we try and create a, a a genuine marketplace where where we can offer. Um, uh, transparency, because that's that, that is a really key thing for for the traveller. So, uh, unbiased, um, un, unfiltered results is is what we what we really focus on, because that is ultimately what people are looking for when they're when they're trying to find uh, best prices. Yeah, but, uh, everything we're talking about here, Alex. It
underpinning it is data. You know, you can't do this stuff unless the data like A is available and B is being shared and computed and uh, insights being drawn from it. And then obviously, as a data company, you're gonna be a massive advocate for open access to data. But, but of course, companies always feel that, that their data is their data, it's their USP, and I'm sorry if you're not having access to it. Is, is that changing, do you think, Alex? Are people starting to think, well, actually, to be honest, a lot of this data is public. It's, it, 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 it's not really my own product. So, um, and actually, I get benefit from, a, from allowing it to be in the marketplace and then extract the insights from it. Yeah, so definitely. I think that it cha it's changing. It started to change prior to COVID, and it started with companies realizing that there's value on data, right? So uh, nowadays, you talk to, to any data generator, and in some cases, don't, they don't know how, but they know that, that, that they know that they need to do something with the data that they generate, right? And they starting to see data as an asset. The point here is that. Uh, it's, it's a raw material, it's a raw asset. So data by itself is useless unless you, you ask the right questions and, do, and you do the right analysis based on, on that data, right? Then when it comes to transparency or, or the ownership of, of data, we have multiple layers here. We, we have the layers of compliance and, and all of us coming from Europe, you know that Europe is probably one of the, the, the strictest uh, uh, legislations in, the, in terms of data privacy which at certain point I think I see it as an advantage because uh, being able to be compliant with that in this market uh, allows you to be able to comply in, uh, globally in, in any market. Uh, but definitely there's a, a, pl a play to, a game to play in, in, in data. Companies are starting to know that. The point is that in some cases companies don't, they realize they have value on that but they don't, they don't know how to extract that value. And this is where um, uh, players like us have our stake to play. I mean, we, we, are, not, we are not data collectors. We are, uh, we are making inquiries, that, that we are making the right questions, trying to make the right questions to data based on what our clients want to know and then extract value and knowledge out of this data. Yeah, I, w last week we held our annual summit in, in London. And if there was one recurring theme from almost all the speakers was we need data scientists in our businesses desperately, yeah. um, but they can't get them or they're not there or if there are, they're very expensive. Yeah. So the travel firms themselves individually are gonna find it very difficult to, they've got all the data in the world, but making sense of it is the hard part. So presumably that may, means they need to look for partners who can make sense of it. Is, is that, I mean, yeah. that'd be great for you if that's the case, but is that, is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, we, we've gone through a process. Uh, uh, we were born like eight years ago and we've gone to a, through a process in which at the beginning, we have to be like uh, shouting out who we were and, 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 and what we're selling. Then in some cases, we started conversations with clients saying, okay, I know what you're doing. I am trying to do the same, so I just want you to sell me, to, to bring me data, right? And I have my own, I'm building my own business intelligence platform. I have my team and we will crunch that data and then it will be open source and made available to the, to the industry and so on and so on. And now what we're seeing is, okay, that process has come and as you, you were mentioning, there's a shortage of uh, skills in the market. And it really makes no sense for every DMO uh, at national, city, regional level to have their own strategy to solve things that have already been solved or that, or that are in process to be solved on a global basis, right? And, and, and this is where we think that uh, partnering with uh, industry uh, players, with key industry players like the ones we have here, brings an opportunity to uh, also to bring a seamless experience to DMOs in terms of uh, giving them the ability to to extract value from that data and and, and to uh, convert this data into insights and into actions to promote and to better know uh, the profiling of your visitors and to, to be able to attract more valuable visitors to your destination. Francois, Amadeus has loads of data. You run entire airlines. We, we talked before we started about your massive data center in Germany, which actually you're moving to the cloud. So that's probably being wound down as we speak. Um, but what, what, what's the future from Amadeus's point of view in terms of not just the collection of data, but trying to derive the insights and feed that back to the industry? So from uh, wherever angle you look at it from, the traveler, if we want to have a seamless experience, we need to share data between the airline, the airport, the hotel, the car rental, 
the travel seller. The industry with the data, you can have better personalized experience. You can have cost efficiency as well in the case of descriptions. So there's a lot of uh, use cases, a lot of appetite for people on data. Now there's two kind of technologies that uh, help people to use data. So there's a cloud, as you mentioned. A lot of this data from uh, us, but from a lot of people in the industry are moving to the cloud, becomes interoperable. And then there's another technology which is coming, uh, which is interesting from the privacy and cybersecurity angle that you mentioned, uh, which is this, uh, this mobile wallet. So on your mobile phone, uh, there's a piece of technology where your own data can be stored. So uh, for example, on the Apple wallet, the Google wallet, for example, I mentioned in Europe the, this QR code for COVID certificate. And there's a law that was passed in Europe to force the European countries to create these wallets. So in the coming years, you'll see in the mobile phones of all of us, a lot of our data being stored there. And that's interesting because if you, can I quote Bob Marley here? Or, so if you, you know the Bob Marley song, you can fool some people sometime, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. And if your data is on your mobile phone, and your data on your mobile phone. If I want to hack your data, I need to hack your mobile phone and your mobile phone. So the way it works is I'm coming on a travel seller website. I want to book. With my phone and my wallet, I say, I am Francois. This is my data. This is my passport. This is my COVID certificate. I like yellow, and I'm vegan. And a travel seller could say, um, OK, this is the offer that you need to buy. And when you come to the airport, if you use this wallet to check in or to board the plane, or at the hotel, that helps all of this data to be stored in a place which is safe. And it helps as well people like us, travelers, to share the data we want with the travel player we want. So it doesn't solve all of the problem. We need data scientists. We need clever questions to ask at the right place. But the, these two technology trends, the cloud and the mobile wallets, are helping a great deal to bring these use cases to life. This being travel, however, every solution begets the next problem. So if, if, if that's the case, everyone's going to be petrified. Their phone breaks. They run out of power. Because without that, they, you know, they're going nowhere. So I suppose, and that's not really the travel's gift to solve, is it? That's the mobile phone companies. That's battery manufacturers, et cetera. So and it is true, actually. A lot of, of advances in travel do require advances in other sectors which you can't control. So, and, I mean, we, we have to hope that's going to happen, but it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a fair point, I suppose. You, wanna, you don't want to add more friction and more stress into the travel experience. Travel is such a big part of the, the economy that it's good to see as well that travel is bringing these problems to other industries to innovate in batteries and things like this. I'm confident that we'll be a lot of, uh, seeing a lot of innovation in, in, in that space too to support these use cases and, and more. And, and Mike, on that data privacy side of things, there's going to be a difference between if you're a leisure traveler and a business traveler. Now, actually, you'll have both on your site, and you may even not know what, who's who, because they don't tell you necessarily when they're looking for a flight. Um, when it's a business traveler, actually, uh, because you're traveling for somebody else, in terms of it's, is it your, maybe your personal data, to be honest, because it's the date, maybe the data owned by the corporate that's sending you places. So, and, and they need to know where you are, and they need to know things about you for corporate responsibility. So actually, this thing, this the sort of thing that Francois was talking about, you can see working much better in business travel, and a little bit more difficult in leisure, where maybe a customer says, hey, you, you know, you don't need to know a lot of everything about me when I'm going on my holiday with my kids. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, as a meta, we, we don't have um, personal data or not a great deal of personal data, but data does play a big part in our business. Um, we, we, we have some fantastically powerful forward-looking demand data, which allows us to identify uh, some of the trends that I mentioned at the start. Uh, something I found really interesting recently was, um, you know, from a DMO perspective, um, travelers who are looking at, uh, I think it was San Francisco as a destination, the other place they were looking at was Dubai. Um, now, they're not automatically aligned, but that, that they are competing against each other from a, from a, a, a traveler's perspective. Um, but again, data is a big part of our business. Um, we use that, we've, we've had our data publicly available to, or, or available to the marketplace um, for some time. But to your point about data scientists uh, and, and the, the scarcity of them and the expense of them, we, uh, in 2019, we, uh, we created Travel Insight Vision, which is a visualization of the raw data that we have in Skyscanner. Um, we, we made that available to DMOs during the pandemic and to airlines and OTAs so that they could better understand um, what was happening in this particularly volatile time. Um, so if we think about sort of seamless travel, um, and we talk about the airport experience, how it links to car hire, but there are so many other aspects of travel. And 
it takes us into this idea of, of, of multi, multimodal, which it, people are out there trying to create these truly multimodal booking sites. But, uh, but Alex, we're not there yet as a, as a, as a, as a business. Do, do, you, do you think that's where travel is headed, that we create a true multimobile experience door to door? So you, you can combine your, your rail, your flights, and even some micro services like electric scooters and bikes to get you that last mile. Yeah, in, in fact, it's something that we also saw during COVID, uh, right? Uh, uh, we as a, a data providers for industry, we were highly reliant on air travel data, which is which accounts for a big um, uh, percentage of, of uh, people moving around. But if you look at last year's season in Europe, for instance, uh, the land travel increased a lot, and even people prefer to take a, a, bo a ferry boat to go to, to, to the island in, in Europe rather than take a plane because of this perception of being safer to, to be on a boat rather to be, than to be on a plane, which is, a, again, it's a perception, maybe not based on scientific basis, but it's a perception. And the matter here is uh, we are not discussing if the perception is good or bad or it's uh, uh, scientifically backed, but it's how the, the, the visitors perceive. And if the visitors perceive that this is not safe, I, I don't care, you have to address to address this. So definitely with we, we're seeing a switch to multimodal uh, uh, travel. Again, this is also a trend that was coming back. I mean, uh, some of our clients are uh, mature coastal uh, leisure destinations in the Mediterranean. And looking back at w how tourism looked like 10 years ago, you have the big tour operators uh, with the highest share of demand, and uh, I was looking the figures of last year, and it was less le less than a 10% of the, all, all their visitors. So, airlines have evolved to, to do this. Dynamic packaging has has evolved. There's a still probably a a, a, um, a segment of demand for for more standard package, but th these are more open package over the time. I mean, it happens the same with technology, with what you have in your mobiles. You you you. Having di different apps and different solutions out of different providers, and the end of the day, if something better fits you, better better serves your your requests, I think that it's something that that it's going to succeed. Yeah, uh, Amadeus obviously known for distributing flights, and that's where the business started. But I, you, you're in others. You know, you, I know you've got a big hospitality sector, um, integrating rail, etc. So. Is Amadeus going to be the driving path force to create this multimodal future, Francois? So if you want to make uh, this multimodality seamless, you need companies in the middle that can connect all of these local businesses and the local specificities. So that's where a company like Amadeus is, is really good at because we have this global presence and this technology workforce to integrate with all these players. So if you take it from the travel setup point of view, if you want to have a package with a flight, hotel, car, cruise, whatever, all of these, if you want to make it seamless, all of these would have specific requirements. So let's take the example of the traveler paperwork. You see this visa, this uh, passport, this, uh, all of these things. So a company like Amadeus can aggregate all of these companies, rail, uh, plane, and you name it, get all of these requirements, help the travel seller to collect all of these documents, to pre-process them ahead of the trip so that we have the first benefit. No bad surprise when you travel, right? No denied boarding, nothing like this. And then if you work with the access control systems of this player, so for a cruise, you need to queue during the pandemic to show your papers. You don't need to queue anymore because you can automate this verification system to get the travelers on their trip. So that's one of the things that we do at Amaius is to connect all of these players to make sure we can collect uh, all of the requirements ahead of the trip so there's no bad surprise. And when we automate the access control systems, replacing what used to be a face-to-face -face check to let you in your travel service, we get rid of the queues, or we, we automate most of the queues. So that's one of the nice um, angle to the seamless uh, experience, as you mentioned. We don't want bad surprise. We don't want to queue when we travel. And a company like Avalius can connect all the players in the middle locally to make this happen. You're not the only company trying to do this. There, there, are, there are new entrants coming at it from a very much a non-legacy tech side of things, just using API, cloud, et cetera. You, you're moving from legacy to cloud. So there's going to be a competition, actually, to do this. It, I don't, is that good for the customer, or is that just going to be confusing? Because we're talking about a single platform for everybody. 
whereas there actually may be competition for, for between platforms. So that's going to be, or between intermediaries, which is going to be tricky. Yeah, but I think it's good for the customers and it's good for us as well. What competition allows is people to provide various bits of the technology. All these bits of technology needs to be connected. And you see some standards emerging, and when there's no standards, you see companies like us, global companies, to bridge these local technologies to make it seamless. And that's excellent. It accelerates the pace of deployment of these technologies, and either the standard way or the aggregator way, you'll see people making this happen, stitching all of these uh, competitive products into one single thing that works. Globally. A, a good example of that, I think, is your recent announcement of uh, an integration with Teams, with Microsoft. Uh, and actually, Microsoft, I know, is, is, is a big partner of yours with, uh, in the cloud project. So you announced that on Teams now, groups of employees can book a trip together on Teams. They don't have to go off Teams, which, you know, that, that does sound like the future. I mean, you, you can almost see in, in, leisure, in leisure travel, maybe you can do it on WhatsApp with a, a bunch of mates just chatting about what they want to do this summer. That, that, that does sound like the future, doesn't it? Where that, that is just seamless, it's really quick, and you don't have to go off to different platforms. Yeah. It's, it's quite an interesting uh, story, and it's, it's a bit of a bridge between the work life we had during COVID, meeting people on Teams, and the work life we used to have before and we will have a bit in the future as well, meeting people in places like this. So what we did with Microsoft is to integrate within the teams when you chat on the meeting, the ability for the people on the meeting to say, hey, why don't we meet in two weeks time to do a sprint review, to do a business event or whatever. And from this interface, you can start to book the trip with a group of people in there. And that can help to calculate where we should meet based on the location of people and access to the booking engine to make this booking happen. So it's a nice bridge between the kind of uh, remote working experience we had during COVID and the experience we want to live again with from time to time meeting people in real life and helping to power this booking to find a place to meet in a week or two. And, and, and Mike, talking about this sort of idea of patching things together in multimodal, you know, Skyscanner isn't just looking at flights now. You, you look at car hire. Um, there are other sectors of travel as well. And actually for the customer, they don't really care that you're a meta. They don't even know necessarily need to know what meta is, what the model is. And I know you went down the road of facilitated bookings so that they don't have to come off the Skyscanner app or site to, to make the bookings. Is that progressing? Are you, gonna, are you gonna increasingly do the job that we were talking about where you're gonna sort of stitch together and provide that seamless experience for the customer, whatever they're booking, multimodal? Yeah, I mean, uh, Skyscanner, uh, we don't, to my knowledge, certainly have any ambitions to move into the multimodal space. Um, but what we do, you know, to, to, to your point, is um, what we've started to do is, is showcase some rail options where rail is a viable alternative to, to, uh, to flight travel. So we're doing that now in line. Um, and that's driven out of a, 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 an increase in demand and focus on sustainability. But some of the things you were talking about there in terms of the, uh, you know, the integration with Teams, in a previous role in Skyscanner, I, I worked in our B2B business, which was a, um, a distributing our own API to other parties. And it's fascinating to hear what's happening there because we had some really interesting conversations with some uh, uh, Southeast Asian chat applications, um, a Barcelona-based um, uh, virtual keyboard. And it was very much that thing about bringing travel into that conversation and, and facilitating it at the point of discussion. So it's really interesting to see that you've, uh, you've launched that with Teams. So and talking about the rail choices and options, that brings us into the sustainability thing, which, we, which, which, which Alex mentioned earlier. And, and Skyscanner, not only are you showing rail options, but you're also, you're also trying to show to the customer what the CO2 of each flight is, so that it can sort of start to make a bit of a choice based around the greenest flight. Are you seeing that happen? Um, are customers making that, that choice based on the data and the information that you can surface to them? In increasingly so. Um, there's a couple of interesting uh, stats here. So two in five um, say the pandemic has, has given them sort of food for thought, if you like, in terms of, of uh, sustainability and how, how travel impacts that. Um, over half of the respondents of a, of a recent survey um, were convinced that it's everyone's role to, 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 to give back to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, the, the sustainability piece. And 65% of global consumers agree that making travel um, more sustainable is key. But a significant proportion of them, this is an interesting point, didn't know how to do that. They didn't know how to make travel more sustainable. So the average consumer, a lot of them don't know how to make travel more sustainable. So that is a, a key, um, I think I'd call it a responsibility of Skyscanner and everyone else in the marketplace is to facilitate that and enable travelers to make those sustainably driven decisions. Do you get an inclination through that, your stats that the people are prepared to pay more to, do, to, to travel sustainably? 
I, I actually couldn't tell you that. Um, I don't have any of those data it points seems, to hand. Seems a, it seems a big question. Alex, is, I, I, maybe Alex has got the answer to that. Uh, uh, what, what we're seeing is that people is uh, considering sustainability of, uh, as, as one of the key indicators when looking at the destination, right? And, and one of the things that we measure now, well, it's also not only the footprint that we also uh, give to the destination. So we, we can tell any destination uh, in the world what's the CO2 budget for their visitors arriving into destination. Based on the CO2 data that it's quite an standard right now, we can tell you the average of uh, how many kilos or tons of CO2 uh, means to bring a, a visitor to your destination. But we also measure the perception. Again, we're, we're moving into the perceptions of visitors related to how sustainable a destination is. And again, there is for sure a market segment that is looking at this and probably is part of their decision making process and probably is, is, is willing to, to at least compare alternatives and, and maybe to pay an extra, an extra penny for this. But then you have to, n not only to, to promote this, but then you have to meet the expectations. Right? It's not only that you advertise yourself as a destination, but then you have to meet the expectations. And then there's still another component that we look when looking at uh, uh, sustainability. We're talking about tourism sustainability, not only environmental sustainability. And that's the one related to the impact to local communities. Right? So it's, it's not only how sustainable a, a hotel is or how efficient, fuel efficient uh, an airline is, but also uh, how the, the behavior of visitors when they are in the destination in terms of spending is supporting small businesses, for instance. Uh, or, or on the contrary, uh, if you spend all your money into the hotel and you are not going out to the hotel, your impact in local communities probably is, is lower than that. All these components are increasingly being part of the equation when it comes to, to visitors uh, decision-making process. Obviously, or origin markets may, may change and may be more prone to this. The Nordics in Europe has been doing this uh, for a while. I, I was talking to somebody at Expedia um, a few months ago, and he was telling me that f for the, the Nordics market in Europe, the key indicator that they were requesting to include when looking at hotels was their environmental uh, footprint. So on the display, when you're, you're addressing to a, a client in, in these markets, you need to have this, because it's one of the key elements for the and, making. And I guess as the focus becomes ever greater on this, and, and actually folk maybe outside of travel, the focus is on the air side of it, but it's crucial the industry makes people, or reminds people, it's not just about the flight, it is about the Absolutely. overall sustainability yeah. of a trip, yeah. because it's just about the flight, and you want to be sustainable, you may never set on foot on an aircraft again, but yeah. you, do other you do a lot of other things when you're in destination, which are definitely sustainable and help sustain local populations, as, you, as you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a balance between the offset of, uh, obviously, burning fuel on a plane has a, an impact on environment, uh, that's, that's, that's evident, but then uh, it's a balance of uh, what you're doing at destination, what's your impact on destination, and how this uh, balance with the, the, uh, the bad impact that it, it, it might be doing. G going back probably to, to uh, your questions uh, around uh, people willing to pay more, what we're seeing also is uh, on a corporate travel, uh, we are also seeing a trend of companies setting a carbon footprint budget. As w as, uh, the same way that you have your, your travel budget during the year, you may have this CO2 budget. So we have three tons of CO2 for this year. And it's your choice, it's, it's, it's up to you to decide uh, how to, to apply this. The, the, the question of whether you would spend more is, is, is relevant to the whole, everything we were discussing. Are you, are you prepared to spend more for a quick, quick um, journey through the airport? Are you, all, all these things feel like a bit of a luxury, which maybe people are prepared to spend more on. But actually, they, they should just be part of the travel experience for everybody and, and part of the basic price. Do you think that's where maybe it's headed, but maybe initially people will spend more, it'll be an ancillary revenue for firms before it becomes just accepted and becomes part of the norm. Maybe that's one for Francois. So you, you see that, uh, that kind of pattern in many industries, in many products, often something new will be sold at a premium. And then uh, companies will want to fight to have it first, 
uh, they will pay more for that, travelers will pay more for that, and then when it becomes feasible to make it work at scale, it becomes a must have. So the laggards actually must buy it to be just at par, and it may become commoditized and part of a part of the natural um, um, experience, if you want. So for uh, this seamless traveler, checking your paperwork ahead of time, don't queue, look at your carbon footprint, what will stay a premium, what will become part of the norm, it's hard to tell, uh, because there's a lot of um, constraints in each of these use cases that drives uh, operating costs for travel players that may make it worth to make it uh, still a premium experience for people who want a benefit or something that can operate uh, at scale. For carbon footprint, if you look at uh, the past few years from travelers, from businesses, it seems to be something that uh, should be here to stay. So we hope that this would become something that covers um, all of the travelers, tra leisure and, and business to some extent. And there's nothing like a bit of jealousy amongst consumers to drive adoption, you know, a bit of FOMO. And interestingly, in the UK, on the beach, one of the leading OTAs, latest advertising, is all about skip the queue um, as, as standard. So we don't pay for it, we give it you as standard. And you've got this family going through an airport looking very smug <laughs> as everyone else is waiting in a really long queue. So there's that, that, that will drive adoption, won't it? I do think so, yeah. yeah, yeah. When you see this, you basically want to be in the same queue, no? You don't want to... <laughs> And I suppose that, I mean, this, this, the regular Skyscanner customer just, just wants to have that joyous experience. They don't want the stress of getting to an airport. They don't want the stress of being in a busy airport. So, you know, they ex this is what it comes back to that expectations thing we started to talk about in the first place, that COVID expectations have raised the bar. V very much so. And, um, you know, whilst we'd all love to be able to go fast track through the airport, what what I talked about at the start was um, uh, the, the, the increased propensity for people to spend more on their travel. So what, what that's um, playing through to is more premium economy um, and probably more business class flights are going to be coming through as well, which obviously comes with the associated benefits. We, we, we're running out of time rapidly, but I, I, let's just finish with some, uh, uh, just a bit of thinking about how this may end up in the future. We, we've kind of reflected how, how complex this is, how many areas of travel that can be addressed, and they can all be addressed with tech, there may be a one big, big bang solution, unlikely, I think. It's, it's going to happen piecemeal. And whether there's really an end, end destination to this, I'm not sure. I, is it just important that travel tries to do this, even if we know we'll never get to the truly seamless trip? But if we, didn't, but if we don't try as an industry, then you know, we're just accepting a, an inferior experience. But, but the key thing is we have it as an end goal, even if so, shoot at the stars and you hit the moon kind of a, idea, Mike. So I'm not sure what the question was. Well, just it, 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 do you think we'll ever get there? I think is what I'm oh, saying. I mean, right. is the seamless, is the is the truly seamless travel? I mean, we could we could discuss how that might be. The, the car hire the car hire example is one, but when why not get to your hotel, never talk to anybody, you just walk up to your room and you walk in because your mobile phone opens the door for you. That that seems like a long way off as well. Yeah, it does. I mean, whether we ever get there or not, I'm not sure. But we we were, we were running an interesting campaign recently on uh, on Skyscanner because one of the pain points of travel can often be when you land at a destination um, and you're picking up a hire car and then you have that horrible queue after you've been through a queue to get the car. Um, my boss actually found a, a, a promotion on, on Skyscanner for keyless entry for a hire car, which he's booked, um, which basically means when he gets off the, the flight at his destination and he comes through security, he doesn't have to do anything to pick up his car because he can use his app on his phone to actually activate the car hire. So um, will we get there? I don't know, but I think we'll continue to make um, uh, good progress towards a, a more seamless travel experience. Same question to you. I mean, we've, we've not even talked about what we do in holiday experiences, um, but you do see some signs of it. Say, look at, at cruise. Um, the, the, the modern cruise ships have apps, customer apps now, which almost seamlessly control, uh, not control maybe, but give them control over their experience on board, whether it's dining, being on the sun lounger, ordering food, etc. So you can see where it could go. But do you think it? Do you think it's generally going to be there for all travel, or is that the beauty? Travels are always going to be a little bit frictionful. So I'll be a bit bold. I think we will get there okay. for the experience I'm talking about. There's no way in this century I need to carry paper, and for people when I travel to check this paper, when I book a trip, all of these papers could be digitized. I mean, governments are digitizing the passport. In a few years, you won't get a piece of paper, or you will get a piece of paper plus something on your phone that says you have a passport. And this technology will help all the people who need to check your passport to do that 
digitally ahead of the trip. So I do believe that in the coming decade, we won't need to show our papers when we travel again. So there'll be no bad surprise when you travel because of that. And I do believe as well that these digital keys in hotels, in car rental, these biometric gates in airport are getting there. The penetration of uh, self sales check-in digital keys in hotels is respectively 30% and 15%. You see biometric gates in more and more airports. You see car rental who wants to operate at a lower cost using these technologies. Sure, in high-end, you still have the human touch experience, but you can complement that with this end-to-end -end digital experience. This, I do believe, will happen. This experience, no bad surprise because you check your paper before you travel, and no queuing because these systems can verify who you are when you come to pick up your car or get in the hotel room are going to happen yeah. at scale. There's, again, there's this thing in technology, isn't there, where there's over-optimism in the short term about what technology can do and under-optimism about what actually the long-term impact is. And, but actually, and then actually, if you look at what happens when there's a real focus, look at the car industry and how that's transformed. We talked about electric cars with, before, before this um, session, weren't we? The speed at which the adoption has gone, I mean, that is just incredible. And, and you, you, you really think about 20 years ago on mobile phone, I mean, you wouldn't believe you, we're here today with the mobile phones we've got. Uh, Alex, are, do you share Francois' optimism around, around that? Or, or, yeah. or will, there, will there always be some problems to solve in travel? No, I, uh, yeah, the, the, the point I was going to make is I'm sure that, uh, or I agree with this optimism, but uh, also looking back to what happened in the past, the, the friction points, for instance, take the travel, the, the flight uh, process, a lot of components of the friction came from uh, things that are out of scope. I mean, all the friction we have in security right now is due to something that happened 20 years ago. I mean, 25 years ago, you could buy a ticket and board a plane without showing any ID if you were flying domestically. And you can fly with an, another passenger's name, and, the, and that didn't happen. So uh, COVID example is the same. And it's, it, it came, and it now seems that it's, it's going down. But I still had to show my COVID vaccination uh, document two years ago, uh, two days ago, to board the plane to, to come in here. So I am sure, and I'm not a, fu a futurist, but I am sure that there, there will be new challenges to be addressed. And technology will be here to, to solve part of these challenges. And also, I think that uh, there's a mix between the, the unknown and the new challenges in the future, and also the changing patterns of, of consumers. Right? And, and in my view, probably, the seamless experience with hotels, with travel, with cars, it's probably going to be mainstream. But then maybe when you look at some segments like luxury, or you think in terms of checking in at, at, at an airport, in the future, maybe it, it might be only a first class experience. So only if you want to be welcomed and recon at the, at the checking by your name and say, Mr. Villeda, hi, we have available for you the seat that you, it, it, it might be the case that you would like to interact with someone. Same happened to, to a hotel. If you're traveling for business, maybe the, the easiest way is you walk into the hotel and you go directly to, to your room. If you are on a luxury uh, breakdown, you might be recognized by your name when you arrive at the at the desk at the hotel. You want to interact with someone at the hotel and you want to sit with some, someone that may help you to plan your uh, weekend at the, at, at the destination, right? So on one side, we see the unknown and the unpredictable that may happen and may put additional uh, layers of, of challenges. On the other side, you see the evolution of what consumers, next generations, boomers, uh, X, Y, Z, millennials, uh, are used to and uh, are valuing when, when deciding their, their experience. Okay, look, the, the, the time is, is nearly up, the clock's ticking down, so we're gonna draw, draw it to a close. Um, but I think as you, you know, the thing about travel is, I guess, on the whole, is that there's always gonna be a degree of serendipity about travel. It, not everything's ever gonna be totally organized for you, and that's not really what consumers want. So I think we've always gotta think about what the cons end consumer wants, and, and and maybe you know a more seamless future is on the way, but there's always going to be those points where the consumer has to find out things for themselves, and that's one of the beauties of this this industry. So um, look, th please join me in thanking the guys for their time today and their insights. Thank you to Alex. Thank you to Francois. Thank you to Mike. Thanks a lot, guys.